Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Betsy. Um, Betsy is my best friend, so I don't know how you will, how, how you will trust what she says. <laughs> A friend would obviously say that. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I wanted to come here, but uh, earlier, some years ago. But unfortunately, I couldn't. But uh, today it came true, and uh, I'm here at Yale. And I'm really honored and very uh, glad to be here. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, my, my speech will uh, focus mainly on some of the problems we face in Ethiopia and how we try to address them. And I hope uh, not only they are uh, common in Ethiopia, but I hope uh, they also represent many of the challenges that we face in our continent. Uh, so, uh, but in order to make it a, a soft, maybe, uh, or smooth, uh, start. I would prefer to start it, to start by saying something about how we started, you know, business or partnership with Yale. And I will quote what President Clinton uh, said uh, when he was awarded, I think, in 2005, uh, in his uh, speech. Uh, I will read it because it's a direct quote. Uh, we only go into places where the government asks us and we work with them to develop their program. It's their plan, not ours. Uh, this, this is really incredible. This is one of the areas I will be speaking about. That's why I started uh, from what President Clinton said. Then I will tell you how it all started and what President Clinton makes sense even on the ground. You know Ira Magaziner, uh, he was, uh, I think, a uh, senior advisor to the president when he was uh, president. And he came to Ethiopia in uh, 2006. And the first thing he said was exactly what the president said. By the way, this speech, I found it elsewhere. Nobody gave me, but now, you know, you can Google anything anyway. <laughs> so I got it afterwards, by the way. Uh, not before I met Ira. But Ira said exactly the same thing, Ira Magaziner, when we met. Uh, and he asked me, I think he came with Joe Cushion, his assistant, and he asked me what support we need from them, what our priorities are. And he said, we will help you whatever you want to do. It's yours, it's not ours. If you want us to work with you, we come. They were not still in then. If you don't want us, we don't come. So tell us your priorities. Let's discuss about them. And we can design ways of helping you based on your wish. And that was incredible. Then after we have discussed with Ira on the major areas of co collaboration, then Ed, Edward Wood came. Ed now is the CEO of the uh, Chai Clinton Foundation. Uh, he came and exactly the same thing. And Edward's job was to start the job based on our agreement with Ira. But he was exactly saying the same thing. And I was really surprised. After we started working based on our agreement, President Clinton came and he had a speech in the African Union, and he said exactly the same thing. So that's when I knew, I think this is a value that this Clinton Foundation really shares. Because all staff are saying exactly the same thing. This is really a very good value. And a value that we really want as beneficiaries. You know, many countries in the developing world, be it in our continent, Africa, Asia, Latin America, or Europe, countries who are less developed, want to be heard, want to own what they do, want to really uh, own 
their future and starts from ownership of what they do, what they want, but also recognition by their partners the same uh, way. I mean, the ownership issue. Um, then after we have started anyway with Clinton Foundation, uh, the major area that we asked them to support us was hospital reform. I hope my colleagues here told you a number of times about our successful partnership on uh, hospital reform with Yale. Uh, then Clinton Foundation brought Yale University into the picture to help us with the, you know, de developing a new design, new model for hospital reform in Ethiopia. By the way, before we asked Clinton Foundation and Yale came, we asked many partners if they would help us in designing new model systems to reform our hospitals. Because our people were complaining, of course still complaining, because there are still many challenges, about the services we give, the quality of services we give in our hospitals. And we identified that after listening to our people who need the services change, we asked many partners to help us in designing new models, standards, to improve the quality of services of our hospitals. That was the wish of our people, that was the wish of the government, but the response from partners was not positive. And that was not surprising because many partners prefer to be involved in, some people call it sexy programs. Could be HIV or malaria or TB, something that really shows impact immediately. If you invest on systems, even before you see the change, it takes time. So they prefer to be involved in something that could be visible from the start. And that's why we had difficulties convincing our partners to accept that system issue. System issues are really, I can say, neglected in uh, many ways. So that makes it different. It was our priority and many were not willing to support that. But I think an institution which has a value of supporting based on the country's needs has accepted it and brought another partner who really believes exactly the same thing. Then after we started interacting with Yale, it was again the same value. Of course, President Clinton was uh, educated here. I know. Uh, maybe he got the value from here, but... Aha! <laughs> so our interaction um, with Yale again was exactly the same, based on our wish, our need. We say, of course, our contact is uh, Betsy, Professor Bradley. We say this is what we want, this is how we want to do it. Please help us on th this way and say, you get it. No problem, because your wish is our wish. That's what they say. And that's really incredible. And I think that helped us in really making this partnership successful. You know, owning your business, it doesn't mean that you don't listen to others. You listen to recommendations, you know, the recommendations they give, if it makes sense to you, of course. If it's really in line with what you want to achieve, if you really convince it. But if not, you should still be supported based on what you need. Uh, you know, to achieve and how you want to achieve it. So that's exactly the value that we have seen also when partnering with Yale after Clinton Foundation introduced us with uh, Yale University. Uh, and when I say successful, as you know, uh, or may know, uh, the hospital reform manual was finalized, some, and then we call it blueprint some years ago, we implemented it, and there is a second, uh, revision, uh, second um, edition now, a revised uh, manual uh, that incorporates both the original blueprint and BB BPR, so better shape. Of course, we need to do continuous improvement, and we, we can improve it on a regular basis. And based on that, many hospitals have really changed the way they uh, work and they're making significant improvements in terms of the quality of services they provide. And 
what our people were wishing is coming now, changing. Of course, they're just encouraging results. I'm not saying we have done really a lot, but there are encouraging signs and encouraging results that are happening because of the introduction of the new design. So that's one success. And not only that, after we have started working on the on the design, new design for our hospitals, we have discussed with Yale on starting a new master's program on hospital and healthcare administration, MHA. And we have agreed on that. And by the way, the first batch graduated two weeks ago. 25 people graduated. And in Ethiopia now, we, we will have the first professional CEOs who have <coughs> hold masters on hospital and healthcare administration. And we're starting the same course in Addis Ababa University. That's why Dr. Getinat is here with us. And uh, we want to train as many uh, uh, professionals, I mean uh, MHA graduates as possible in order to uh, lead or manage our hospitals professionally. So, all what I said uh, really is a clear uh, understanding or a clear example, example, if you like, of what country ownership is. By the way, I, that's one of the points I want to speak today, and that's why I started with that. But country ownership, as you know, um, is defined by some, you know, in a different way, and I will give you some examples. Uh, but I have already told you the example of our partnership with Chai and Yell, and you will say for yourself which one is the best uh, meaning in terms of country ownership. This, I took it from someone called uh, Willem Buter. He was working in the Eastern uh, Europe World Bank uh, unit. And uh, from his research, he found out that there are three uh, different views of uh, country ownership, especially with regard to plan. Country has designed, country has significant involvement. This is second opinion. The third is act authorities were informed. You see? So involvement in design, I mean, the, the, the country itself designs it. Then the second is the country is significantly involved in the design. And the third is the authorities were informed. Then in the implementation, I will tell you another other three views that really relate to this one. The country implements the program. The country plays a significant role in implementation. This is the second one. And number three, authorities of the country are kept informed. So this is also country ownership. Um, I'm focusing my speech on this because it has a very important element in the success of programs or in the success of whatever a country wants to achieve. Because from the example I gave you, we wanted a hospital reform because our people wanted that. Based on that, we got a support, and it's successful now, and it's even uh, going from strings to strings. And with ownership, as you can see, there is clear commitment. And that commitment can make things happen. Not only make things happen, meaning getting results, but at the same time, you can, start, you can sustain also what you have started. So it has a serious implication. And from the three that you have, I have read on the plan and on the uh, implementation, I think it has to be, the plan has to be owned by the country, designed, of course, may need assistance uh, during the process, and the country has to be ready to implement it also. When I, this, when I say this, as I said earlier, it doesn't mean that the country doesn't listen. It listens, and I will talk about best practices later. 
and should even actively search for best practices and incorporate it into its plan and identify best practices and incorporate it when it uh, implements based on the plan. So it should be willing to embark into continuous improvement and needs to really listen every now and then. But the ownership unequivocally should be the country's ownership. And to do this, the country should be ready to claim that and say, this is my responsibility and this is my vision, this is how I want to get there and help me base it on this wish. And our partners should also be ready to accept that and support. Still, understanding that during the engagement, many things could change. Still, by, should be by empowering the country in question. So that's the greatest value you have. And that's why I want to thank Yale for this. I want to thank Clinton Foundation for this. Because that means a lot to us. That means a lot to developing countries who want to have a say in what they are doing. Because it's when you have a say in what you're doing that you can commit to it because you own it, because it's yours. Then it's when you commit to it, you can bring results. And when you bring results, that's it. The outcome definitely will be having impact on the things you want to do. So the first is just to tell you how it started and how it's related to country ownership and also what the roles of these two great institutions was. And I would like, by the way, to thank um, Betsy for all uh, her support and, of course, representing Yale. That's why I'm saying Yale and Yale because she's the product of Yale and uh, I can see through her how Yale is really repositioned in terms of the things I, I said. And we want you to help us continue uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, then, uh, with regard to, I, I think I um, was informed about one question that, uh, of course, it will be related to country ownership as well. One question about how we used uh, PFAR money or global fund money in strengthening the health system. And it's related to ownership, and that's why I'm uh, starting with this one. Uh, just wanted to include it in my in my in what I'm saying. Uh, as I said, if you want to own your own business, it should start from planning. You should really own the vision. You should own your plan. And in Ethiopia, what our government did was it put a vision of 20 years. This is five years ago uh, for Ethiopia to join the middle income countries in 20 years. This was five years ago. So it's in 15 years from now. And that's the PASDEP uh, target. And then the health sector development program is within that. And in the health sector development program as well, based on the countrywide plan, uh, we have targets set and owned by the government itself. Then what happens is, uh, in that HSDP, for instance, we have five priorities, HIV, AIDS, uh, TB, malaria, maternal health, child health. These are the priorities in Africa. I don't think there is any country that, whose priorities are not these five. And it's not a coincidence, they also are the same uh, MDG goals. Uh, then after identifying our priorities in that health sector development program, we identified the vehicles to, with which we can achieve better results in the five areas. And these are, I don't know if you heard about the health extension program, but the health extension program, our flagship, that's a community-based intervention. Then expansion of health centers, that's also as part of the primary health care. And of course, the hospitals, which, which I told you, which mainly focus on improving their quality of services. But we put primary health care at the center of the program because the five could be addressed using the primary health care approach. So we have identified that. 
and we set targets. How many health posters do we build, equip them? How, you know, the, um, the number of health professionals we need, and health centers also. How many do we have? How many do we need in order to, uh, you know, cover the whole country? And what other needs do we have related to that? So we have identified that. Then the third category was, after identifying the three vehicles, the system issues. What system issues do we need to address now? Which ones do we strengthen? And which ones do we need to um, change uh, totally? And we identified those areas and information, health management information system was one. Pharmaceutical finance supply system was another one. Health care financing which covers health insurance was a third one. And human resource development was another system issue. And harmonization and alignment based on parish declaration was the fifth one and other system issues. So we have our priorities. We know the vehicles and we know how to, and we have for the priorities, we have targets that's based on MDG goals, on some of them even more ambitious than that. Then we have the vehicles, the three vehicles, but the main focus being the uh, primary health care. And we have the system issues which I have outlined, the five and more, actually. Then we have this, meaning we want where we, we would like to be in terms of this, uh, five, you know, the three areas. Uh, the priorities, the vehicles that will take us there, and the system issues we do to strengthen the vehicles. So we have a vision, a government vision, uh, middle income. And to, to reach there, all sectors have developed their plan. And the health sector being one of them developed its plan, a very aggressive one. And the, country, the government's three uh, principles in the preparation of the plan was, it has to be as fast as possible, it has to be as big as possible, and you should keep the bottom line quality. So high speed, big volume, and acceptable quality, of course, within uh, the development stats that we have. So we developed that plan. And when we negotiated then with PEPFAR or Global Fund, it was easy. Because we, we know what our targets are, and we know how to achieve them. Then we say, for instance, if I tell you about the vehicles, OK, we're building 15,000 health posters. And we will equip them. And we will train health extension workers. You help us on this. Then health centers, same thing. We want to build 3,200 health centers. Of course, we have 600. 2,600 will be built in the next five years. We need money to build those, equip them. And we need health officers, nurses, and so on to staff these health centers, to start working. And about the hospitals, which Yale and Clinton covering, we identified that we need this, and we need this kind of support. This is what we want to achieve. Then the information system, the pharmaceutical finance, the health insurance, all the system issues, exactly. We want this, and this is how we want to achieve it, and we need your support on this. So one thing that I found really fascinating is, if you know what you want, even a funding which is vertically raised can be used for something that uh, can cover your own interests also. Like, uh, I think this guy is from Mexico, I forgot his name, but about r vertically raised money can be spent horizontally or diagonally, which is true, it can be spent. But you have to make your case. And what I said was fascinating was, people were saying, oh, this is PFARI's emergency fund, I don't think you will convince them to really use this money for health system strengthening. Don't even try it. Why? Why not we try it? At least we ask. If it's not possible, then it's not possible. To say it will not be possible without even trying it doesn't make any sense. What do we waste by asking? What do we lose by asking? So let's ask. We asked. And I don't know how you were amazed by the Global Fund, but even with PEPFAR, there is funding already allocated for the system strengthening and also for building health centers, equipping them, everything. Not very different from Global Fund. Why? Because we started 
negotiating based on our plan, the plan that we own, a plan that we want to achieve. And they said, okay, we can do this. Then another day, okay, and with PEPFAR, we have a forum, a monthly, that I chair, representing the government, and the ambassador of the United States in the country chairs. And he comes with his team, I come with my team, and then we meet on a regular basis and discuss. This is what we want. You help us this way. Oh, but this is emergency. No, no, but we can do it this way. For instance, I will give you an example. Uh, we need um, to expand ART services, yeah? We need to give ARVs to people living with HIV. And in order to do that, to expand the services, you need institutions. If you don't have institutions, you cannot do it. Then that's how we try to justify it. For instance, you want to do PMTCT. Are you going to do it under a tree if the health centers are really not expanded well? You can't. You need a facility. So that health institution, you needed to do ARV treatment and PMTCT can also be used to do basic obstetric and comprehensive care. So that's how the vertically raised money is addressing the purpose the money was sent for, but at the same time is covering additional services, saving women's lives. And the, the thing that really made this happen was knowing what you want and knowing how you want to get there and negotiating and negotiating, understanding their perspective, knowing what they can, knowing what they can't, being in their position also, trying to understand them, and when needed, even helping them, when they cannot do it, understanding them, but at least to the maximum, use what's possible. So it needs a kind of you know, relationship and continuous engagement to make that happen. So we were committed to continuous dialogue, continuous negotiation, and to make use of the, any justifications that we can have to use the funding diagonally or horizontally, but at the same time understanding them, to understand their side, and they try to understand our side too. So it's like saying, okay, we want to achieve the same goal, you know, saving lives. So if the goal is the same, then it's not very difficult for people to see from each other's angle. So I see from their angle, and when they cannot do it, I even sympathize with them, say, oh, this is, they can't do it. So let's maybe try some, some, something else. But it worked. It worked. So I think we, we, we have, by the way, continued that forum. And the new ambassador, Ambassador Booth, also is committed to, to that. And our government is committed to that too. You know, continuous dialogue. Now, I think with the Global Health Initiative, um, it's the same um, direction that we were asking for, that Global Health Initiative is uh, suggesting now under uh, Obama administration. That was what we were asking for. So the dialogue and negotiation will be easier now because there is a formal recognition by the administration that, you know, we should approach it in an integrated fashion, integrated health approach. So that was what we were asking for and that's what, what's coming now. And we were not surprised, by the way, when we heard Ethiopia was part of the eight countries for GHI plus, because that was what we were asking for and that was what we were pushing for and how we implemented and we used PEPFAR funding to strengthen the health system. We used it to build health, health centers. We're using it to build our HMIS, our uh, 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 pharmaceutical finance supply system, our human resources training, even generic, uh, you know, and there was no problem as long as we were ready to really engage, discuss, understand each other, 
uh, and build that relationship knowing each other. That's just knowing each other, knowing them, knowing their difficulties, and under, at least using what's available. So that's what happened. With Global Fund, the same thing. We just ask, knock, knock, knock. And it was relatively easier even. This is what we want. This is what we planned. This is how we want to get there. We need to build these other institutions. We need to equip them. The government is committed. We even challenged the Global Fund by saying, we will build, if we build one health center, would you build one health center? Matching. We don't want to even, you know, sit wherever we are and say, give us. They say, we will do part of our job with the resources that we have. And there are regions here with me, heads of regional health bureaus, states. And they raised enough funding from their own government to match uh, each health center built by Global Fund. So if Global Fund builds one health center, the government builds another health center. And they have allocated funding for that. And that kind of partnership, I think, can be inculcated if we just engage each other and listen to each other and understand what could be possible and use that possibility to the maximum. That was what happened. But even in PEFAR and Global Fund, people thought there is, it's emergency, so it's very tight, very strict. No, there were opportunities. They seem very small, but if they can be understood properly and really positively, and if, can be, if they can be discussed candidly, I think we're enough to cover the whole health system and to support the whole health system. And that's what we have seen with PFR and Global Fund. And that's how we used it. And just addressing uh, one of the questions. Uh, and then with that partnership, maybe uh, one thing that's very clear was uh, when you say, I want, I want to do it, I want to get here, I know how to get there, uh, at least maybe you know part of it and you may need a lot of support. Uh, so although I want, you know, health management information system, but I don't know how to do it, how to, to prepare the design. Then this question brings a very good, um, brings a very good way of using technical assistance. What I'm saying is, okay, I need a new or modern health management information system, but I don't want, I don't know it. So what do, what do I do? I ask for partners saying, you know, can you give us technical assistance on HMIS? So the technical assistance which is coming is based on your need. The hospital reform, for instance, when Yale came, based on your need. Pharmaceutical finance supply system, based on our need. But do you know many countries complain now, but we don't speak it candidly? When a certain partner comes with a technical assistance, ideas and technical assistance and say, you know, I want to do this, I can help you on this. We don't say no. We don't say, no, no, I can identify what areas of support I need in terms of technic technical assistance myself. We don't say that. And that's the problem. But when you know the plan, the most important element comes with it. If you know what you want to do, although you may not be able to do what you want, to design it and implement it, you can ask for technical assistance, which is a better or more effective technical assistance because it's coming based on your need. And it becomes cost effective also because that's what you want. And you can also own it and use it uh, for the future. So I think knowing what you want is uh, very clear. And then the candor, I said it um, uh, already, but uh, just to mention that it's very important and I would like to also provoke you by raising one issue candidly. I had um, a speech in uh, Center for Global Development on Monday and it was about country ownership and I was 
describing country ownership, starting from planning to resourcing, budgeting, one plan, one budget, one report, then to uh, implementation, to monitoring and evaluation of the result framework outcome, and so on. Then, uh, this is a guy I really respect. Uh, I don't know if you know him, uh, Mr. Edward Scott. He's the chairman and founder of uh, Center for Global Development. And he's the founder of debt, uh, something, uh, relief, and, and so on. Uh, he said, do you know, uh, I was asking for, for instance, budget support to countries. If countries could get budget support, which is very flexible, based on their plan, they can really use it flexibly and properly. So uh, we're really tired of thousands of transactions because we plan thousand times to 1,000 partners we plan, then, uh, you know, monitoring and, and evaluation with so many of them, and we report to all of them. And this transaction is really wrong, very confusing also. So using budget support, it would be, uh, you know, the best. And he said, do you know some partners complain about? Then I said, what? They think that corruption is preventing them from doing it. Because it could be true or wrong, it could be perception or reality in some countries, but that's what they are saying. Do you really honestly discuss this and candidly discuss this with the uh, partners? I think that was very important. So I, I really thanked him for, for that uh, comment. And what I'm trying to say is, Everybody agrees that budget support is very important, especially to use funds flexibly. But when we discuss about that, together with corruption and embezzlement and so on, uh, which could happen in countries, do we really discuss it candidly? So if you talk about ownership, I said we need to discuss really candidly. And do we have that candor? And are we ready really to, under, to take it to that level? If we can take it to that level, then I will take you back to what I said earlier, that regular engagement and knowing each other and discussing about issues really helps because it's through regular negotiation, regular dialogue that you can build candor. If there is no like regular interaction, regular relationship, dialogue, it's very difficult to inculcate uh, or to cultivate candor because first time you meet, you cannot say, you know, people would consider it even as arrogance if you are like, you know. <laughs> but through dialogue, through regular relationship, even what's making them uncomfortable, as what Edward Scott said, can be discussed candidly. So when we say candor, it, it doesn't come just suddenly. It can be built. And to be built, there should be a forum. There should be a continuous dialogue. There should be a relationship that we can develop. Then trust each other. Then that's when candor will also be more effective. More effective. And to use the funding which, which was coming the way we wanted it, I think candor and that regular engagement had helped. We didn't start by saying, let's speak candidly. We started the forum. We started to meet. We started to have a common platform. We started to know each other. I started to understand their difficulties. They started to understand my difficulties. Then that continuous engagement started to bring really candor and started to really understand each other. And uh, that's why uh, some of it we tried to uh, really at least uh, use the PFR and Global Fund. Of course, uh, what we thought was seemingly small or a small impact now is really big because uh, we used uh, that flexibility that could be very small flexibility, but f that flexibility to build the whole health system. Then I will take you to another problem that we have is the human resource development. In human resource development, as you know, uh, uh, there is brain drain in Africa. And you can call any country in Africa and whose doctors 
could be more in another foreign country than in the country itself. For Ethiopia, for instance, that's what they say. Uh, 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 it could be right, but I don't know. Uh, it could be right, the number, considering the number of people I, I met even in Washington, D.C. Uh, but we believe that in order to address that problem, uh, we believe that uh, there is some uh, problem in understanding uh, the real issue. Uh, what I want to say is um, we, we consider the cause for the problem is the brain drain itself. But in Ethiopia, we believe it's not the brain drain which is the cause of the problem, the shortage in, in Ethiopia, for instance. The problem is the mismatch between supply and demand, meaning in Ethiopia there is a huge demand, but we are not supplying it or we are not producing enough. And because of that, we changed our strategy. Instead of blaming those who are poaching from us, our doctors, why not we just see inside, you know, internal problem. Then the internal problem was we were not producing enough. Ethiopia is a really big country. Do you know until uh, three years ago, uh, the enrollment rate was 250 doctors per uh, year, which is very small for 79 million population. Now the last two years, we have tried to grow that and it's now 1,400. So from 250 to 1,400. And in three to four years, we can enroll up to 4,000. Do you know Egypt addressed its shortage of manpower, especially doctors, by doing exactly the same thing. Do you know that they graduate 12,000 a year? And the US graduates 13,000, I, I read. So because of that 12,000, they don't need to take from others. They even, <laughs> so uh, I think that's one thing that we have to um, uh, correct, by the way, because from my uh, interaction with many colleagues, they complain about brain drain. You know, people are poaching from us. No, but can we see inside and see if there is another problem, could be major cause, and it's the supply and demand mismatch. And by overproducing, we can address that. And we have already done it for the low-level and mid-level health professionals. Nurses, we have more than enough now. Health officers, in just three to four years, by July 2011, we will graduate 5,000. And more than 50% uh, of them have already graduated. By July 2011, the 5,000 total will be reached. So you can do that. And we have health extension workers, 35,000 army. Nurses, even better than the WHO standard now. By just over producing or flooding strategy. So we're following now flooding and retention strategy. So you just produce as much as possible in order to address uh, the shortage. That's the best way uh, to address it. Then when you have shortages with doctors, what do you do? What we're doing is we're engaging them honestly, regularly also, the few doctors that we have. We give them pre-deployment training. We train them on the strategies of the country, you know, development strategies, including the health strategy. And we help them to understand uh, the country. And we tell them candidly, by the way, we started by holding their degree, not to leave the country. When you have shortage, you don't have any option. So we hold their degree so that they will not leave the country. Then they were very sad when we did that. Then when we met, we honestly told them that it was wrong to start without even discussing with them. We never even discussed with them. So we ad admitted that, we asked uh, excuse, and then um, uh, we started this good relationship by candidly discussing about the country's problems Kandor again here, he comes here, reach the consensus on how we can address the problem, and then we found a growing commitment in them. A few years ago, maybe we used to uh, 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 deploy not more than 30% of them. 70%, we don't know where they were going. Now we deploy 
more than 90% of them, they go. 95%, they go where, where they're assigned to go. And through candid discussion on the problems, reaching a consensus on the problems and causes, root causes of the problem, and also on the solution, and then to develop commitment uh, to help uh, the country. And it's much better after we really started candidly communicating with them. Uh, so my time is almost uh, up. So the one last thing I would like to say is about best practice. And one problem we have identified in best practice is there could be best practice, but we don't learn from each other. There are best practices, by the way. I can tell you when we designed our new models, information system, logistics, health insurance, for instance, we learned from Rwanda, from Ghana, from Tanzania, from Mexico, from Nigeria, from Taiwan. So our health insurance is now a cocktail of experiences from many countries. So one thing we have identified, which could be the same in other countries, is we don't look for best practices actively. And that's we admit, what we admitted and tried to really um, look for best practices. Of course, this is a government reform. We are doing it as part of that. This is not because this is not what the health sector started. This is what uh, the government started. You know, we need to change. We need to reform our system, and that's why we started looking for best practices. And other system issues: pharmaceutical finance from many countries in our continent, from Asia, Latin America. We learned a lot. And disease prevention, especially the CDC type of model, we copied from CDC. The whole motherboard. Of course, we cannot implement the whole motherboard, so we took a piece of what, you know, something that looks like CDC, and we, we have already started implementing and starting, started even training FELTP, master's program, you know, the Epidemic Intelligence Service, Service Officer, CISO. You can copy. Why do you reinvent the wheel? I think in, 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 the, in Africa, especially in our continent, and almost, it's true for many developing countries or mid-level, mid-income, they don't need to invent. They can copy. What they copy could take them, like could make a difference of how many years? Maybe 50 years, 100 years. Yeah, it's true. We can copy that, and then from that, we can maybe go into the cutting edge of innovation. But do we care about it now? So there are best practices elsewhere. So we don't learn from, from each other. And the other problem with best practice is we start a very good one, lab, based, good outcome, best practice. We don't scale it up, even, after, even in the country. So even in our own countries, there are many best practices, but it's maybe in one district, in another district. And we don't really scale up that. So that's another problem. And we need to identify best practices from inside, see how to scale them up, and even from outside, and how do we scale them up? Because without scaling them up, I don't think there will be any uh, impact. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank uh, all participants here. And I would like to end by saying you know, whatever uh, we can learn from this, I think we have to uh, take it and prepare it also to scale up. But I hope what Yale started should grow, you know, to share best practices because there are many be best practices elsewhere. And all of us can use cocktail of best practices to make our systems better. So we're starting four countries. It's alphabetical order, not because I uh, am favoring my own country. <laughs> Ethiopia, Ghana, Liberia, and Rwanda. Let's start it. To be honest, we learned a lot from you. You don't know, but we came and learned a lot from all of you. And we should do it consciously, you know? Why, why not we have really a strong and continuous forum like this one? and try to draw practices proactively. And maybe the next meeting, of course, organized by Yale, but we can uh, do it in Ghana. 
And I should say uh, also that uh, I'm proud of Ghana. At least that's our pride now, the only. <laughs> the <laughs> so maybe a gift for that and learn from what they're doing on the ground. You know, a gift for their, uh, for the soccer, you know. So I would be happy to go there next time and see what's, what's going on. But not only health insurance, we learned many things from Ghana and many others. So let's really open our eyes and let's, let's learn from each other. There is a lot of things to learn from each other. And ours is really something that has been done by many countries, you know, uh, successfully implemented that we're trying to make it ours. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank all those who have supported us on this. So thank you so much again. time for uh, just a couple questions, maybe two or three questions, and Dr. Tedros, you said you'd be willing to. Of course. Okay, so candor, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, I've met you uh, so many times, and uh, I've always been fascinated by um, the way you come out, the way you, you present things, and the way you encourage people. Remember that uh, uh, you were with our lead minister, yeah. uh, Kwashiga, yeah. and uh, we really admire you. What you've said is true, every part of it. But I want to look at it at the um, governmental level and see whether even at that level we shouldn't be coming together to look at best practices and how governments can be together to let us pick these things up to work on in our countries. Human resource is a problem. You've, uh, you've been able to, to manage it well. Health insurance is good in Ghana. The four countries are learning a lot. We hold, at the governmental level, we have various fora. We hold ECOWAS meetings, if it is East African bloc, if it is uh, AU. How do we get ministers to be together and say, look, um, Ethiopia has done it. In our next meeting, let's see the number of uh, ministers that will report on it. Because sometimes we hold things this way. We will have good discussions. It is that my minister made me to go for it. But really going back and putting it across and being acceptable becomes a problem. People like you with vision and very well respected I believe at the governmental level, we should have one, two, three areas. Let us report on them. Let us see how we move them. And let us see how we move together. And uh, that is what I will want. How do we get our ministers at the various fora to really accept that we have to achieve results and not make uh, take so many things at a time, but take them in in a manageable manner so that we can achieve results. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm seeing many faces similar, so I told them the same. It's all in the middle, eh? Okay. Okay, please. Thank you very much for the very inspiring uh, speech. I would like to know um, the budget support. You mentioned the budget support. I think it's a very good thing. After that, uh, how do you engage the partners in monitoring what is happening? Uh, in Ghana, um, DFID and it have put virtually everything in the budget. And we realized that then they begin to fold up the NIDA begins to fold up the office. 
Uh, then I went and said, uh, why do you fold up the office? I is there something more that they can do to strengthen the system? I, I want to see how, to know how you've engaged the partners in uh, strengthening the system on a continuous basis apart from um, maybe just uh, giving the funding. Yeah. Okay, so I thank you so much. I mean, the first one is uh, a comment, so I take it as a comment, and it can uh, uh, help in ensuring accountability, as you rightly said. And it can also help us focus on the most important, you know, areas or limited areas, but really uh, important areas to focus on those. And uh, the uh, high level. Uh, relationship can also be built. So uh, I think that's uh, a very good comment. Uh, but the other thing I would like to say is it's, it's good if we have platforms, you know, common forum and, and so on. And we should really push for that. And that's why I suggested if we can, you know, let this, yeah, grow. And then discuss on tangible uh, best practices. By the way, I was very happy when I heard about uh, Live Area's experience on, uh, re you know, weekly reporting on women, Live Area Ethnology. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want to consider that uh, because maternal mortality is the most challenging now of the, all the MDG goals, and it has to be treated accordingly. Uh, we're trying to focus on uh, maternal mortality and trying to really learn from what uh, others are uh, doing. And uh, although uh, not uh, really push it a lot, but we are also working on the performance-based financing of uh, Rwanda. Of course, health insurance and so on is gone. So one thing I would, um, uh, you know, the common is good, but the country should really believe that uh, should really believe in best, getting best practices proactively itself. Meaning, for instance, Rwanda should continuously scan the environment and get all, any experience that it can get, starting from neighboring countries elsewhere. Uh, then, if you do that, when you get together, when you use the platform, you will have even more appetite because you, 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 you want to do it, whether there is a platform or not. So it, sh it should start from really being interested on your own, you know. So I, I encourage that actually, uh, and then that could lead us to the platform. Then when we uh, meet, it's like honing or refining or agreeing on some really uh, best of best and so on. Otherwise, we should always realize that uh, looking for best practices should still remain the country's main agenda. And scan its environment. It should start, by the way, from its own country. Uh, for instance, in Ethiopia, there are really best practices in one corner, in one village or in one district, but which is not uh, identified. So we should start from identifying that, using that to scale, and you know, drawing best practices from starting from neighbors and, and elsewhere. So it should be the responsibility of the country first. And it should really uh, be actively searching. Then the platform will help us in honing it. Uh, but I take it as a comment. It's, it's going, it's, it will help that individual efforts and identifying even better impact best practices. Then budget support. Um, we, we have started, by the way, the, um, in Ethiopia also, pooled funding. Uh, signed joint finance agreement with four bilaterals and four multilaterals. Uh, and the idea is, uh, you know, they pull the funding, it's flexible, it's not earmarked, and we are expected to give them one plan, and then during the reporting also one report. So it's, this is based on the idea of one plan, one budget, one report. So it's one plan. Then one budget is they send their, fund, their money to our account in one pool. 
then we only report once to all of them, to eight of them at least now. Uh, and it's only starting, by the way, and the first, I think they contributed around 200 million US dollars, but this is a lot of money, by the way. Uh, and they are now abiding to that one plan, one budget, one report, at least these uh, eight uh, partners. And the engagement is, during the planning, they want to know what we have planned. Uh, and not really the, uh, to endorse it, but they can comment on that. If we accept it, we take it. If we don't, they still don't mind if we go ahead with our plan. In that plan, what interests more is, interests them more is the result. Because they want to see during the reporting whether we have achieved what we said we will achieve. And they're giving money, so it's fine. So uh, they comment on the plan. That's when we engage them. And then they give us their feedback. Many things we accept because they have many experienced uh, people, you know, who can help. Those we don't accept, we say no, because maybe we have reason not to accept that, but we, st we still go ahead with the plan. And then when we report, they check the results. So the engagement is lighter. So checking at the plan, not to endorse, but to have a look what we have planned and what we're going to achieve. Then when we report, then they see thoroughly whether uh, you know, we have achieved our targets uh, or not. Uh, support from them, even if they close their offices, uh, to be honest, I don't know if I'm going extreme here, but I, it wouldn't matter. Because as I said earlier, if you need technical assistance, you ask it specifically, and a technical assistance can come for exactly what you wanted to need assistance for. Not just regular uh, support, but very targeted. So the technical assistance could be for six months, three months, or one year, or two years. It will be based on your need. So it doesn't matter whether they have the office, your, their office in uh, the country or not. As long as there is a mechanism to see the plan, then a mechanism to transfer the funding, then a mechanism to get the report and comment on the report, because that's the most important one. When you need technical assistance, it will entirely be up to you. You know, of course, to build your capacity, you need technical assistance. Then it has to be tailored based on your need. So these are the two, I think. Huh? Baka? Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so. So thank you very, very much once more. Thank you for having me. And I wish you uh, all the best. And uh, let's continue having best practices. Eh? OK, and, and learning from them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Tedros, I would like to give you this on behalf of Yale, which you've mm -hmm. spoken so highly of, and GHLI as well. And you seems as if you've given us our agenda for the okay. next decade here. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.